eight, seven. Okay, we're live. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> What's up, guys? Uh hi. Anyway, I don't really know who is gonna listen. Like, there's always some interesting audience. Um, I just did a live at 9 a.m. and then there were like some people like talking about really asking really amazing questions. But, oh, okay. Let's start with your dad is a Greek taxi driver who gave really good like philosophy kind of questions that kind of like make you feel like what okay so let's talk about from that and how do you become this like super student who went to ivy school and then like running endowment founds and like you know all that stuff oh my gosh well that that's a that's a crazy story in itself but you know my dad is this like taxi driver who imagined like everything he learned about america he learned from the movie the godfather so he would say like all these like cryptic things like yeah son where you're going i've been and I'm like, what does that even mean? Um, but I got really lucky. Um, I was in Brooklyn, um, you know, grew up really humble, um, uh, really, really poor. It was actually amazing when I think back um, how lucky I've been in my life. Uh, and my parents really kind of pushed, um, pushed me to do well in school. And there was this boarding school that, uh, that had this program for inner city kids. Um, and if you had, uh, you know, kind of low income and high, you know, kind of achievement, um, you could, you know, apply and get it. And if you got in, it was a full scholarship. Um, and I remember these guys came to my middle school and there was like a, you know, a near riot going on during the assembly. And this guy was up there. Um, actually, actually, I'll tell this story real quick. Um, the guy who was up there was this guy named Jim Ventry. And, um, and Jim was like kind of trying to talk over the yelling of all the kids. He just, you know, thought it was a free period. And I was like in the front listening to this. And I went home and I told my parents about this place. And my mom says, no, I will not send you. She's old Polish lady. I will not send you to boarding school. That, that, that is crazy. I want you here. And my dad says, my son, in America, there is a system. And if you're part of the system, the world is your oyster. This he is really place, smart. You know, he's okay. he's got a, a certain kind of like wisdom to him, right? Mm-hmm. This, is, this place sounds like the doorway to the system. So I went, mm-hmm. um, but the, the funny part of the story is like I show up um, at the school, um, there's this place called Andover, and the guy that came to my school was gone. Um, he went off to law school. He was like a young guy who was doing like a two-year gig before going to law school. He went to law school, had a career in the law, and I never got to say thank you. Fast forward 25 years, I get a call from Peter Curry, who was the chairman of our trustees, and Peter was CFO of Netscape at the IPO on the board of Facebook and Twitter and a bunch of companies that are big guy in tech. And he says, hey, we're doing an, an admitted students event. Will you come and like, you know, tell some stories? I show, I said, Absolutely. I show up, the guy handing out name tags, I look at his name tag, it says James F. Ventry, Director of Admissions. And I go, Jim Ventry? He goes, yeah. I go, "Are you, were you in the admissions office years ago? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I go, where'd you go? He said, career in the law. I said, why'd you come back? He said, I saw the opportunity to change people's lives and ed- how education could be a great vector for that. And I said, I said, well, have I got a story for you? The last time I saw you, I was a poor kid in Brooklyn. And here I am 25 years later, co-hosting an event with Peter Curry at the Olympic Club of San Francisco. And it's all because you came to my school. So I've been waiting 25 years to say thank you. And he started crying. It was like one of the proudest moments of my life. And I was so glad I got to say thank you to him. Oh my God, what a story. And now I feel like you definitely change a lot of people's life we just talked about like your talk at Stanford and case western and then you're like changing other people's life by telling them the story of you and then like i feel like a, a lot of people probably got really inspired by your story now now when you think about it and i like when i was like listening to your like 45 interviews with other people i was like one of the things that you mentioned about like first round capital was able to punch over like their weight class and i wonder um can you elaborate on like okay so let's talk about like the venture capital ecosystem as whole right like so you joined it before venture was hot and now venture is like overly subscribed it's like so popular every nfl player is like a angel investor now like a solo gp everywhere micro vc movement open lp movement so many movements going on and Can you kind of like gave us an overview of like in your investing experience, like what has happened and then where are we going? 
Yep. So, you know, it's really interesting because I started doing venture right after I graduated from business school. I was at Princeton's endowment and um, that was uh, in 2001 and nobody wanted to do venture. And it was awesome because I got to like go to all these great meetings, Greylock and Sequoia and others and be like one of 10, 20, 15, you know, people in the room um, because just nobody like venture was like completely in the doldrums, like the worst downturn ever. And I guess I spent a lot of time with Henry McCants, who was one of the founders of Greylock. And he said this line over and over to me that that really stuck with me. And he says, venture works best when capital is expensive and time is cheap, meaning that people have a lot of energy to devote to, to different things and they're not over busy. He says, what happens during bubbles is that time gets very expensive and capital gets cheap. And he says, mm -hmm. when that happens, watch out. And it was really interesting to see what happened, you know, kind of starting in 2016, 2017, um, you know, with, with uh, uh, there was a real kind of um, inflection in the market where all of a sudden venture became, and it was part of like, you know, it, there was no cost to being wrong. And that's okay. Like we want as a society to, to, to have a lot of optionality, but, um, but the zero interest rate, you know, this thing distorted a lot of asset allocation. And so there are a lot of people kind of chasing, um, you know, chasing growth, chasing returns. And um, and that's why we went from having, in 2004, there were a hundred venture firms writing checks. Mm -hmm. And Samir Kaji over at Allocate, like figured out a few years ago, that there are 4,000 people mm -hmm. writing checks now. We have Angelus syndicates and I mean, it's great because it's great to kind of fund entrepreneurship. But what it does mm -hmm. is the people who are left holding the bag are people in my seat, the LPs, mm -hmm. right? Because all the returns are competed away. And so I've struggled with how do I, you know, kind of, you know, look at the world um, in, you know, in a more competitive world. Because by the way, when I was backing some of the like foundational micro VCs in like mm -hmm. 2005, six, seven guys, like first round and IA and, and floodgate and others, like it almost felt like you couldn't miss, right. It was, there was a real scarcity of capital and, and people doing something innovative. And today it, it, it feels like the world is just too crowded. And so the, what I spend a lot of time personally looking for is people who have some sort of sustainable competitive advantage that lead, you know, everybody talks about differentiation. Some things are differentiated in how bad they are, right? Mm -hmm. Like I actually did a search on like worst product of all time mm -hmm. and <laughs> Evian, the water company made a water bra. And so it's literally like, it's like a camelback, but it goes on your front and you fill it up with water. And I guess you can go on a run and like drink. Now, I don't exactly know how I would guess that would get like really warm. And so that's like a really bad product, but it's differentiated, right? I've never seen anything like mm -hmm. it. It's differentiated in how much it sucks, right? <laughs> um, as, as I often say, alpha can have a negative sign in front of it. Mm. Um, and so, uh, so what I'd say that is like, um, you know, right now there's so many people, I, I have 10 things in my inbox from, you know, just today, people talking about how their funds are differentiated, but that tells me nothing about, their sustainable competitive advantage and how it is that they create repeatability. And like Fred Wilson talks a lot about repeatability and he's, what he says is process drives repeatability, but there's, there's, I think a little bit more to it. So we've been really focusing more on kind of, you know, we're doing a lot of like mainline venture, but we're also doing a lot of um, investing in uh, university related stuff. So like the E14 fund at MIT or the house fund, um, you know, at Berkeley um, and people are doing kind of cool, quirky things like that. It, but I think that's almost like a band aid. I almost feel like we've got a sea change coming in venture, right? This is what I'm trying to figure out. I've been talking to like a couple of people about this. Um, Will Quist, who's a really, really smart guy, is talking about like the storming of the castles and how we, we could see like a generational, you know, kind of shift. Um, you know, I think we'll see like a few years long downturn during which time venture won't be fun anymore. And a lot of the solo people who came in and wrote a bunch of checks, um, you know, the tourists, they'll they'll fall out. A lot of the people who are successful, like aren't, you know, super excited about the grind. I'm, I'm hearing mm -hmm. rumblings of that here in in Silicon Valley. Um, and I think, you know, we could wake up in, you know, if we don't have a good liquidity market through 24 and early 25, we could wake up and see a lot of people actually exiting the business, which I think you've got to burn the forest down to create the soil conditions to have a new growth. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm super excited about. And I don't yet know what shape that's going to take. 
Um, I think there could be something algorithmic that that you know that we look at. Um, people like Chris Farmer at Signal Fire are doing some really interesting stuff um, in terms of trying to figure out how to use data for investing. Um, but I think it's actually a super exciting time because it's in these like momentary shifts that all of a sudden everything. Um, you know, you go from like this, like average to like a real polarized, like there'll be awesome things and, and crappy things that come out of it. And that, you know, it should be like, if you have a you know, good head on your shoulders and are a little bit or a lot lucky, um, you could really like make something happen. I wonder, I feel like you definitely touch on like a lot of really amazing points and I wonder like, okay, so I myself, like from like an observer perspective, looking at the venture capital firms, like everyone, even like the LPs nowadays are shifting towards like building a media empire and then kind of like basically that become some sort of like mode there. And, you know, when you talk about like uh, the house fund or like um, the E14 from MIT, so these are, I feel like are more on the technical mode or like some sort of like the quirky advantages. So I wonder, like, overall, what do you see as like a big shift in the venture ecosystem? Who is going to win? When you talk about the sustainable competitive advantage, you know, there's so many people that are like, in the solo GP era, everyone's amazing storyteller. Essentially, I feel like venture capital is such a sales game. Like if you can really tell a good story, you can receive money. But on the other hand, like you have to deliver the return. I I'm constantly like I like I'm just a student of the business. I when I was looking at people, you know, raising five funds without investing in like a unicorn deal. So like I was just like, I wonder how does the business work from a bare bone level? And when LP is looking at returns and like what are some benchmark to judge the earlier stage people when they have absolutely no data to show their track record? Besides, yeah. they work at like a top fund and they invest in like a unicorn with their 14 people team. Yeah. Well, look, the, the there's a few questions there, but one thing that I always talk about is um is uh you've seen the movie The Incredibles, right? Like you remember the bad guys named Syndrome, mm -hmm. and the bad guy like wants to steal, you know, kind of the superpowers and give them to everybody because he says, mm -hmm. when everybody's super, nobody will be. Right. Mm -hmm. And I kind of think that that um, that's a big uh, issue in venture right now, because literally every every single um, you know slide deck that's sitting here in my email, you know, people are in awesome companies. There's so much like it's it's like um, the endless, you know, kind of the uh, there's this movie in the in the 60s called The Unbearable Lightness of Being actually based off a book. I, I, I call it the unbearable lightness of crushing it like everybody's just crushing it. And it's so oppressive. Um, and, uh, and so the question I, and, and so you asked a few questions that are all kind of congealed in this, like, um, uh, My bad. Uh, no, no, no. It's, it's awesome because it's all related. It's all connected. Um, you mentioned, you know, a lot of these people are creating media empires and I think the, I think, you know, people, people have decided that content marketing is like how to differentiate yourself, which is great. And actually first round, you know, my old, old friends were a pioneer of that, right. With, with first round review and even some of the content, you know, the, the blogging and, and even the, the holiday videos, they used to do these hilarious mm -hmm. holiday videos, right. That was content marketing, right. Mm -hmm. um, as a way to, to build presence, you know, among entrepreneurs. But I think what, what we've seen is this like, um, light touch inauthentic broadcast era mm -hmm. and where we're going i think is like a high touch authentic era if that makes sense right mm -hmm. um I, I haven't really thought through that very much but like the way i think about it is you know everybody's um everybody's like looking for like a great venture firm like right? like or brand, you know, people always talk about brand names, right? Like mm -hmm. and, and brand names, like they're valuable for, you know, for certain things, they create their own deal flow and franchise and, and, and have resources and whatever. But I always think like there's riches in the niches, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you don't have to play, um, you know, the, 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 you know, the, you don't have to swing for the fences, you know, with everything. Right. And so you can find like if you can capitalize, this is something we've forgotten, you know, during this time of, you know, kind of low interest rates. If you can capitalize companies in the right way, um, you can actually make a lot of money on really modest exits. And so um, 
So that has implications for kind of how you build a portfolio and, and how you think about, and you, you want exposure to a lot of different things and you want to get the big winners. But um, but the way venture's been done for like the last five to seven years has made it almost impossible to get a venture return, you know, without like, you know, we've all prayed to the God of power law, right? And mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we're going to see exits like that, you know, for, for a little while. Um, so then the question is, how do you create an authentic connection. I look like somebody else in my portfolio that I love is Sunil Nagaraj at, at Ubiquity Ventures. And he, you know, kind of hosts these like little salons and um, and has a lot of like um, uh, authenticity and, uh, and, and um, resonance, I guess, in like a really cool, um, uh, you know, kind of cool subset of people who are really innovative and really doing some awesome stuff. Totally. Um, I wonder when you mentioned about like authentic high touch era compared to the light touch and authentic era, um, you mentioned about like, um, the salon they host. And I wonder like, what does that mean for like, from like an investment perspective, like should people focus on like offline events right now or like what is that what like i mean from like a technical perspective like yeah. what are things that like people are trying to like get out of these salons and then like in terms of like uh, investing in different people's bond like i guess like what does a portfolio construction look like for lps and when you're looking at these like 400 different gps per year um i guess how do you quickly filter out the you know, the 300 company, like a 300 GP that are not important for you? Yeah. Um, so to, to the first question, you know, like there's, the, I always think of it as, um, uh, as a multimodal world, right? Like, you know, there's, there's in-person stuff. I know, I know a venture firm that does these dinners, they call three by threes where they invite three mm -hmm. people. And then, um, and then each of those three people has to invite three other people. Mm -hmm. And then, it, and you get these like really random, you know, rather than kind of replicating your, your network and inviting the same people, you're getting like these really cool people and or not cool people. Everybody's cool. <laughs> like different people that you might not otherwise, you know, kind of run across. Um, and, uh, and, um, and building your network that way. Right. Um, but, you know, content marketing still has a role and some people, you know, do it really well. Um, but I think, I think there's just so much noise in the ecosystem. It's like, how do you cut through the noise? And, you know, there's definitely some people doing, you know, clever stuff out there. I mentioned, um, uh, I mentioned Sunil and he's got, you know, Ubiquity University, even, you know, Y Combinator. I'm, I'm not like really close to the Y Combinator ecosystem. Um, but, uh, but, um, you know, but they've done some really interesting stuff in terms of, you know, kind of getting content out there as they've scaled, right? Like I was talking to somebody about like old YC and like, you know, pasta dinner, right? Like they mm -hmm. used to do pasta dinner in Mountain View, like, and, and now it's like a, you know, kind of a completely different world. Um, so, so, you know, there, there's ways to kind of maybe create a high, low, um, strategy where um high touch you know low touch but that low touch kind of keeps you keeps you in the mix but ultimately like um i think you know venture venture is a people business and um and it's you know in a you know the world is much more kind of geographically dispersed um you know than it was but um uh but i think kind of maintaining connections to people is is really important and i do think meeting people in 3d right like it's great to see you in 2d but um but mm -hmm. i can't hang out you know irl mm -hmm. um as to the portfolio construction question that's you know that's a phd dissertation there's like lots of different mm -hmm. that. um mm -hmm. i'll tell you from my perspective uh i think and and i you know i I'm open to being wrong. And I'm, I've certainly been wrong during like the go-go period because it's more of an idiosyncrasy strategy than a mm -hmm. momentum strategy. But I think generally speaking, you know, venture is a bad bet. I think if you, every manager you add from my seat, like as a fund of funds or, you know, when I was an endowment investor, every manager you add adds 
you know, 30 more companies, 30 to 50 to 70, depending, you know, more companies. And each company you had, you know, over the last five to seven years, the answer has been gives you a better chance of, you know, getting a power law outcome. But historically, the answer has actually been, you know, just kind of mean reverts you, right, to to an average, you know, index like return. And so, um, because 70% of all venture backed companies historically have not returned capital, right? So every company that you add, you know, has a 70% chance of, of that. Now you could say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm a good selector or whatever. But I just think that instead of diversifying, you're diversifying, right? So I think you should be concentrated, mm. uh, as concentrated as you possibly can be, because the underlying, you know, everybody's like optimizing for their own comfort level. And as it aggregates like up the chain, then like, I'm like, optimize based on everybody else's, you know, optimization. So I'm over optimized and like, I'm not taking on enough risk and I'm slouching towards that median outcome, which by the way, historically has not kept pace with the NASDAQ, especially when you take into account, um, you know, risk and illiquidity that, that deserve a risk premium. Um, so for me, it's like, you know what, like investing is about optimizing discomfort and you want to be really uncomfortable. You want to wake up every morning and be like stressed out because if you're not stressed out, you're not taking enough risk. Wow. Uh, yeah, I feel like there's just so much to unpack there. I want to say hi to the audience. Hi, Mason. Anyway, so let's go back to this PhD of portfolio management. Um, you meant like so basically 70 percent of like the companies we see found back die. Right. Um, and then there are like when you're thinking about you mentioned about like you basically your approach is like a high concentrated approach and then you are basically opting for taking really high risk and i wonder when you're looking at like the new fund managers i know that you uh i think you said somewhere that's like you know the fund five is a new fund three and then the first like uh, the fund three is like the best fund to back because like people start knowing what they're doing kind of thing and i wonder if you start a fund today or you and i start a fund today what are three things that should be our checklist to make mm -hmm. sure that we become the 30 percent like we back the 30 percent company that, that are not going to die yeah yeah um so which by the way real quick uh, just about that math before i forget um you know, one thing that's been crazy, I was just talking to somebody about this the other day, because there's capital has been so cheap and plentiful, company mortality has been like artificially low. So mm -hmm. instead of 70% failing, only, you know, 40% has failed, right? And that's like really propped up a lot of people's numbers, right? And and um, and that's, that's one of these like weird distortions that we'll look back, you know, kind of on this era. Um, and so, so that's why, you know, when we when I look at managers, um, so if we were to start a fund, actually, you know, what I'd say is I'd want somebody who's like, you know, young, dumb, and hungry, right? <laughs> Who doesn't know what they don't know, right? <laughs> Welcome to my world. But anyway. yeah, I, I'm old, dumb, and hungry. So, um, but, um, but, you know, you mentioned the point about fund three and, um, and, you know, I've seen data that suggests the fund threes are the best funds. Like I did these numbers maybe 10 years ago and two thirds of fund threes were actually in the top half, um, which actually is statistically significant. 33% um, uh, were in the top quartile. Um, so that was actually um, actually really interesting. And I think that's because that's where, you know, kind of hunger and experience, because hunger kind of declines, right? You get more comfortable. Um, and experiences on on the rise. And that's kind of where somewhere in fund two, fund three, early fund four is where all that intersects. Um, so I love, you know, kind of young, you know, I'm talking my own book, but I love young managers. Um, I do love people who think about unit economics, right? Like that's actually a big screen um, for me. There's, you know, there's been this kind of growth at all costs, um, you know, mentality. But what, one of the first things I screen on is with managers is I try to get them to explain to me how they think about unit economics sustainably at scale. And because that's what, you know, you know, kind of frenzied, hot mar animal spirits markets come and go, but somebody will always pay you for, you know, kind of profitable growth. 
Uh, and so that's that's something um, something that's important. Another thing I really key on is ownership. Like ownership is a lever that you can pull um, that can help you as as a as a GP. Um, they can help you maximize your outcomes. I've, during this period, I saw too many people who had like 1% of a big outcome and it moved the needle on their fund, um, but it didn't, it didn't return their fund. And if, if they, if they had kind of protected their ownership, um, you know, that would have been uh, a much bigger outcome for the fund, which is related to, you know, I, I like to think of people that have, you know, a portfolio construction philosophy that makes sense. That isn't to say that, you know, like Charles Hudson, super smart guy, his portfolio construction is like in the fund, we only do first checks and then, you know, maybe we'll SPD out the pro rata um, or set up, you know, syndicates, um, you know, and that I, that's not my cup of tea, but it works really well for him. And he's a really smart guy. Um, you know, for me, I like to, I like people who can support their companies um, because I feel like the second check and sometimes even the third check have the most like oomph for a portfolio. You're really buying an option with that first check um, with which you validate, disprove or de-risk an entrepreneur's hypothesis. And then once you've done one of those three things, then you should lean in. Um, you mentioned like really great, like two aspect of things like sustainable sustainably at scale and then ownership um so i've seen like you know from my brief like study slash experience slash like chat coffee chat or whatever with other people i see like two patterns like um one school of people that they just do like you mentioned like about charles like the first check into everything and like then it's a numbers game like invest in 50 company and then like everything uh, basically put in like a similar amount in each company I see a second uh, group of people that's like high conviction, you know, uh, just like investing in multiple rounds of the same company. Um, on a broader level, like who should do one, who should do two? Like well, from the fund manager characteristic, like are the net highly networked individual should do the numbers game or the more like deep tech people should do the second game like is there some sort of pattern to it you know like it's i think it's individual and idiosyncratic to everybody that you know people have their own kind of patterns and styles um and by the way the the, the world is you know is large right like there's mm -hmm. for an investor that like me that prefers mm -hmm. you know kind of conviction driven strategies there's you know three others that prefer um you know kind of high high velocity um, you know, large, you know, power law oriented um, spray and pray strategies. <laughs> um, uh, sorry for the editorialization. Um, but what where I actually see people get in trouble is when they think they're running one kind of strategy, but they're really running another. Um, so I've had people come to me and say, you know, we're a high conviction uh you know, manager, and then they have like a 90 portfolio, you know, 90 company portfolio. And I'm just like, well, that, how do you say you're high conviction? You know, that's a portfolio that makes sense for somebody who's actually like, maybe that person's value proposition is, um, you know, we've got great deal flow. And we're just trying to like, you know, leverage deal flow and find, you know, find the, the diamond in the, you know, in the rough. So, um, it, you know, it, I, one thing I encourage managers, you know, if anybody's, you know, listening to this um, and thinking about, you know, raising a fund or, or in the process of raising a fund, you know, think about like the coherence of your whole story, right? Like it has to be like a unified whole. Um, and, I, and I always tell, you know, in my seat, like we're putting together like a mosaic um, and, uh, and figuring out uh, uh, you know, what we can learn about you, because I'm actually testing a joint hypothesis, right? Like in my seat, that's, what's really hard. If you're a, a manager, like you can look at a company and like, try to understand the TAM and the, you know, the, the, the unit economics and the team. For me, I'm investing in a blind pool and I'm like giving people money and hoping that they do, you know, what they're going to say they do with it. And so I'm almost testing this joint hypothesis, which is like, do they have an unfair advantage? And am I properly situated to perceive their unfair advantage correctly? And that's actually super duper hard. Um, and um, and so like then, you know, because you don't, you know, you don't know, 
you can't, you know, know these things perfectly. You're not in, inside somebody else's head. You try to like assemble a little mosaic and hope that it, you know, based on the things that are knowable and try to figure out like the, the, you know, the, the, their portrait based on this this mosaic with a lot of like missing pieces and gaps. But one of the things you can like really pretty quickly tell about a person is like, you know, how they, um, how they, uh, uh, how they say what they're going to do and then how they follow through on what they're, you know, what they're doing. Do you have any control on like the follow through part? Like, you know, you mentioned about like someone say they're going to do one thing, but they do the other. I'm sure like, you know, from like a GP managing portfolio company, you can kind of like uh, when you're getting some sort of like memo update or whatever, and then you can be like, hey, I just want to check in. Like I saw that you're doing X, Y, Z. Like, do you do that to your portfolio managers? Or like, do you feel like you're just in like a more observing seat of like kind of management style? Yeah, so it, it's interesting because strictly speaking, like once you make the decision, you made the commitment, you know, it's you don't have any control. Now, we tend to sit on, um, you know, uh, more often than not, um, LPACs, uh, advisory committees. Um, but it's funny, what I've noticed in the last 10 years is that LPACs have gotten like less and less um, uh, uh impactful. Um, now you basically just get like, you know, we 10, 15 years ago, you know, LPACs used to, you know, have quarterly meetings or, or, you know, kind of periodic meetings where you'd like really drill into things at a, a very um, in-depth level, talk about meta issues. And now there's, you know, everybody, you know, people use it as a um, feather in their cap and, and, and it's almost become like ceremonial. Um, and really the, the job of an LPAC is to, you know, kind of opine on conflicts. Um, mm -hmm. and a lot of managers don't really have strict conflicts. So you don't, you know, it's, it's some, I'm on an LPAC that hasn't met in like two years, but we just get like an enhanced deck. Um, but that all of that said, um, one thing I really like to do, especially cause I like funding, um, you know, kind of new and emerging managers is I love to get involved as a mentor. Um, and some of the things I'm most proud of um, during my time uh, <laughs> over the last 23 years um, are uh, in this business are kind of the, the relationships I've built with people, you know, kind of working with them, helping them think about, um, you know, their firm growth, building out their teams, thinking about portfolio construction. Um, and I've been really lucky, uh, you know, but you don't get to do that, you know, all the time. Um, and sometimes, you know, I try to, you know, kind of steer people in the right direction. And sometimes they listen and sometimes they don't. Um, and that's that's kind of just the name of the game. You chat about something really interesting earlier. Um, it's like the GPs should know that unit economics. Um, can you, like, elaborate? Yeah, so... Um, so there are a lot, especially we saw this during, um, I, this is a, you know, kind of a horse I, I started climbing on in like 2017, um, 2018, because there are a lot of people funding business models mm -hmm. where there was no path to profitability ever. So then you're playing like your bet, the bet that you're making is like a greater fool. Like, is there going to be a greater fool who's going to, you know, kind of buy this, um, you know, buy this asset off of me? Uh, and I don't think that's a sustainable strategy, especially in in an illiquid, you know, kind of high touch market like venture. And so, um, so I started really pushing my managers, and, and we'd already kind of pre selected for people who think like this. But like, okay, once we once we get through, you know, kind of you know minimum viable product and and you know kind of alpha. Um, you know, test and, and, and beta, and then through to, you know, kind of product market fit, like, once you start scaling, um, how do you make sure that that business is on a trajectory to create positive economic value? Right? And, um, and the underpinning of that is and and because ultimately, like the, the ultimate buyer of something mm -hmm. is either going to be an acquirer for whom that acquisition has to be somehow accretive. And yes, yeah, some people sometimes buy users or whatever, but really what they want is like something that's going to add to their profits, right? Or public market investors in an IPO who are going to run a DCF, right? And you know, I always joke like, you know, 
in venture world, anybody who's run a DCF, like, you know, looks at the, you know, five years or seven years and then does a terminal value and then, you know, applies a discount, you know, rate, um, you know, our companies, all of the values in the terminal value. So it's really sensitive, um, you know, to the, to the discount factor. Um, and so when interest rates go up, that's why the value of these things goes down so much, right? That's a, that's a whole nother discussion I've been having with people. But the question is like, how do you create something that has like an economic, um, uh, you know, value to it? Because uh, one of the things that Mr. McCants told me is he said, you know, think about Buffett's rule, right? Opportunity equals value minus perception. Um, and, you know, the value means like intrinsic economic value, which only comes from like creating profits. But the challenge is like in venture, like lacking, you know, kind of any immediate thing you can, you know, kind of sink your teeth into perception and value becomes like this recursive loop. And that's why companies get like hot and buzzy and like, you know, kind of, you know, blow up in terms of you know, value and become unicorns and whatever. But you haven't actually really created any intrinsic value. And at the end of the day, like some public market investor or an acquirer is going to sign like an intrinsic value. And if the perception is too high, like there's too much hype or whatever, then the opportunity is actually really small. Mm -hmm. um, right. So that's the challenge. And that's what I've been like harping on my, you know, kind of managers to make sure like all your companies have a path to creating that value because that's where the opportunity comes into play. I wonder, like as a fund manager, how do they evaluate their own like portfolio? I guess like, you know, when you're um, thinking about, so I guess like how, um, okay, so I have like two part of the question. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm like all over the place. My brain is just like, I love it. Uh, I think one of the things I have like a question for you as a LP of different funds is data versus vibe. Cause, okay. So as a mini check writer and Joe investor or whatever, uh, I tend to go with the vibe. Like, so, because here's why, like, I feel like, um, when I came to Silicon Valley in like 2014, 2015, something like that. And then when I was surrounding by like a lot of my entrepreneurial friends, some now built billions dollar company. When I first encountered them, I have no, like, I just know they're like hot among my friends who like, uh, yeah like people say really high um basically people like um uh just like think they're really smart however there's also people who my friends think are really smart also when like also create a company that are like not as valuable so it's like kind of impossible to tell so my thought process of like investing in something right now is kind of like a vibe check are they in the right category of things or like are they surrounded by other smart people who speak highly of them and it's kind of like a numbers game right so like you put tiny tiny check into everything but on the other hand you also just mentioned a really good point of like if you own one percent of a company they're not going to return your whole fund um i don't have a whole fund but i have my own like wallet so like well that return my wallet and i wonder like when you're thinking about as an LP, as like, a, um, you know, is this something like a vibe check or like, is there supposed to have some sort of like, you do some sort of model that, I mean, now, of course, you would do a lot of like modeling or whatever, because you're managing a lot bigger money than I personally have. So like, I wonder like when, and then yesterday I was chatting with an investor, their investing is purely based on like data. And then the data suggests that like the startup they're backing are like, oh, having some sort of, um, really high success at the beginning like the the company that they're backing are like they have to demonstrate some sort of like high success factor at the beginning i wonder when you're investing in two fund managers do they have to have like a some sort of like super amazing deals that are happening in their space to make you to give you the high conviction approach to them or like how i guess like do you do the data or do you do the vibe or like how do you do it as like a investor? yeah so it's really funny because like um a lot of people in my seat invest on track record right and um but as i said before you know with uh you know with the incredibles right the syndrome i call it syndrome syndrome when everybody is super nobody will be um you know, it's really hard to like glean anything from the data today, right? Like, you know, I don't want to sound like, uh, you know, like I'm, I'm not rigorous, but I think there's like very limited value to data today, 
Um, and then I was thinking about this. I'm like, okay, so I wrote a, you know, I wrote a blog post in like 2008, like way back, um, where I talked about like our evaluation process. And then I, I, I kind of alluded to it again in the, I, I haven't like written a public blog post since 2017, but it's up on, on super LP. Um, it kind of gives an insight into this and kind of follows up on this for us. So like, it's a four part evaluation process, right? Um, I try to understand the people. What is it that they do? That's, um, that's distinctive and differentiated where they have domain expertise, right? Like, um, uh, 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 you, what is what is their sustainable competitive advantage? I think about the strategy, and I have some opinions on strategy, but I'm also like humble enough to know that there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen out there that's like um, that I don't, you know, I'm not necessarily seeing around the corners, but I'm hiring GPs who are really smart who will do that for me. So if I can, what I'm looking for then is the resonance of the strategy and the people, right? Are the right people pursuing the right strategy? And, and is that a strategy that's worthwhile? Out of the people in the strategy falls the portfolio, right? Like the proof of the pudding mm -hmm. is in the tasting and that's that's where it is. And you know, you can you can spend time with, I spend a lot of time with, you know, portfolio companies, with founders, trying to understand um, you know, what they're doing is in an interesting company, how these people got involved, why they chose them to, you know, how those people earn the right to be, you know, in that company, et cetera. And then out of that falls the performance and it's a lagging indicator, not a leading indicator. So I was thinking about this the other day and I'm like, wow, I just said a lot of words to basically say I'm investing on vibes, right? Sure. I'm just trying to pick up the vibe and if the vibes are immaculate, we're in, right? And Thank so, you for saying that. You just make me like sleep better today, but keep going. Sorry. I, I think ultimately, like in a high, you know, a high touch business, it's very qualitative. In a sense, that's what you're doing, right? You have opinions and viewpoints that inform like what you think are good vibes. Um, but ultimately, it's just one big vibe check. Um, and, I, you know, I, I feel like I'm being a little bit flip in saying that, but, but, you know, Everybody I know who does what I, I, I who does what I do, at least a you know a big part of what they do is like reference checks, right? And you're just trying to understand who these people are and how they're doing what they're doing, and you're picking up the vibe. Um, and so, like, I used to be a little bit sheepish about saying that, and now like vibes are very like you know now. Wow. So I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm here for it. Oh my God. Uh, thank you for saying that. And like, I, um, it kind of like, it definitely makes me a lot more relaxed because I feel like you are someone who is like tremendously more smarter than me. <laughs> I, don't, I clearly don't know what I'm doing. So I'm trying to do a vibe check on what I'm doing anyway. Um, I wonder how do you kind of educate yourself? I know that you invest in like data collective and then you went to like a data random data conference or like data gathering, yeah. data, whatever. Um, What's your information diet like look like? Because you seems like very articulate and then you're obviously super smart and like you have a lot of you kind of like educate yourself in so many different places. And I wonder for someone who is like who admire you and then who for people who want to one day become you, like what are things that they should consume to get there? You're gonna make me blush. Um look, you know what I think. I, I think that a kind of a childlike curiosity is, is kind of what's important. And I'm like, I'm super, and there's so many different ways to do what we do like that. That's like a message that I, you know, I give my kids all the time is like, there's a lot of different things that are cool. And there's a lot of different ways to do those things. Right. <laughs> and I know people who do what I do who are salty AF. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I don't know how they like can get excited about things. Now, maybe I'm kind of like, you know, like a, like a golden retriever, like my tail's always wagging. Um, and I'm always trying to figure out like what, um, you know, what's out there that's kind of, I love technology transitions. Like, um, and, and, and actually let me like rewind. Like um, I have a cousin, um, you know, who's, who's considerably older than me. Like has always had health issues and has been like homebound. And she loved Star Trek, like the OG Star Trek back in the 60s. And she like would always buy me the books. And so I grew up like reading Star Trek and science fiction, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And like it really um, caused me to 
instilled in me a belief in like a utopian world. Um, and like some, maybe I'm a little bit of a techno utopian. And like, I think, you know, I, I love the poet Walt Whitman, right? Like, like the essential American poet. Like I'm, I'm sad that we've like forgotten Walt a little bit, but like Walt Whitman writes about California in 1850. He says in California, I see the genius of the modern, the child of the real and the ideal. Right. And for me, that's what venture is. And it's that like curiosity that, you know, makes me, um, makes me really excited about the future. And like one thing that I, I you know, you, like you mentioned the data collective thing, like I first heard about data collective in 2010. Um, I was at a data scientists meetup in, uh, in San Francisco. And I just like decided to go because I'm like, what, you know, I keep hearing like about data science, like, is this finally, are these the people that are going to finally bring us AI after, you know, kind of 30 years of promise. And I was talking to this guy who looked like Hagrid right? Like from, from Harry Potter, like seven feet tall, black leather duster coat, wearing an Iron Maiden, you know, t-shirt or some other heavy metal band. But of course he had a PhD from Carnegie Mellon and another PhD from Stanford, like big, big brain. Right. And I'm like, tell me about, you know, the people who, are, who you think are interesting. He says, oh, you got to talk to Matt Ako, but people like you won't get him. I'm like, what do you mean people like me? And he's like, you finance people. You, know, you look at the world like through like, you know, kind of too, too stringent, you know, kind of a lens. He goes, so you won't get him, but for people like me, he's in our tribe, right? And the second I heard that, it was almost like a head, you know, you had me at hello moment. <laughs> like when I heard he's a member of the tribe mm -hmm. um, of these people who are doing some really interesting stuff. I was like, okay, let's go. Um, and so, uh, so that's the kind of stuff where I get, you know, kind of super excited. Um, but it's, you know, but it's, it came out of that curiosity, right? And even like, I think about our own portfolio right now, like, you know, we have to differentiate between Web3, which became a synonym for crypto and Web3.0, like in the Tim Berners-Lee, you know, I, and just to geek out for a second, like, I remember hearing this Tim Berners-Lee talk, like in 2008 or nine. And he was talking about like the evolution of the web from the static web to the social web to the semantic web, which is web 3.0. And about like the changes in like the data infrastructure and the compute layer and then the interaction space and how like basically everything he said has come true, right? Like going from web one to web two was like going from a static, like I'm sitting at my keyboard to like now being out in the world with like a device, like i.e. an iPhone, right? And then like the, the web three, like, We'll, there'll be sensors everywhere that kind of pick us up. And, and we've got several companies in that kind of human computer interaction space. And I'm so excited about it because it like says to me, like a few, like it's a, it portends a future that's like much more um, has much like better um, uh, ease of use for humans. Right. And things will, you know, services and products will get delivered much, you know, more easily and seamlessly. And, and, um, and, you know, there's a lot of things that could go wrong, right. And the future won't be evenly distributed. Right. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that we're struggling with today as a society, right. Mm -hmm. Some people are still living in, you know, kind of 1930s America and some people are living in, um, and we see that through health outcomes and, and income and, and consumption and, and other, all kinds of things. So off my soapbox, but that's the kind of stuff that gets me excited and having that kind of like, um, you know, kind of, you know, childlike enthusiasm and a desire to be um, uh, an investigative journalist, right? And to actually like mm -hmm. dig to pick up the vibes, um, you know, because some things like when you're out in the field and like talking to people, some things just hit different. Totally. Um, how, like, I guess, like, when you're thinking about the venture capital world, like people, GPs talk to each other. Um, I assume LPs talk to each other. And I wonder, okay, there's like two really random questions. I wonder, like, what was your first interview like when you were like getting into like Princeton, uh, Princeton Endowment Fund and, like, you know, compared to when you started your own fund? And I wonder, like, on the other hand, like, how does the LP social aspect look like? Um, you know, I know you play golf and I wonder, like, is this like just like a massive amount of people play golf all the time or like... Uh, how do you kind of like structure your day? Yeah, that's, uh, that's super funny. Um, it's a, let me, the, um, the, to answer this kind of social question, LPs talk relentlessly. Like um, mm -hmm. I, th I've talked to GPs who have no idea how much LPs talk. And 
it's and sometimes like I remember like one of the first lessons I got in this was there was a big fund that is still very successful today in 2002 was trying to like pass an amendment and they called us at Princeton. They're like, well, you know, MIT and Harvard and, and Yale and Stanford have already signed. Um, so you guys should sign. And I picked up the phone and I literally called everybody that they mentioned and nobody else had signed. And I'm just like those lying bastards. Right. And, mm-hmm. and I confronted them with that and we were, like, wow, we had no idea. You guys talk. I'm like, that's all we do, right? Like we're in the information gathering business. We're picking up the vibes. Um, and so, and particularly like annual meeting season, LPs are going from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting. And it's like a traveling party certain times of the year. Um, and so, and I think that's a great, it's, it's actually like, a. we talk a lot about um, GPs who the first topic of conversation is always GPs who are doing us wrong, right? Like, um, you know, raising a fund that's too big or, or, um, you know, the amount of like gossip that goes on is pretty remarkable. Um, I would, uh, yeah, I could tell you stories that probably aren't, aren't appropriate for a podcast, but, um, of things I've heard that have really opened my eyes, um, uh, to what GPs have been doing. But we also talk about people that we're excited about, like young up and coming firms. And um, and once, you know, you, if you can get an LP as an advocate, you know, they bump into their friends, you know, kind of constantly. Um, and so, you know, the golf thing is like, there is one big LP golf tournament I go to um, where we, all we do is, you know, talk shit about GPs for for two days. Um, but that's really the only work golf I play. You know, some of my investors play golf, but, um, but GPs don't play golf like they used to. That's such a great answer. What does raising funding look like for you? And then like, I know that like, you know, you mentioned it super casually as like you work at like Princeton endowment fund. Like it's kind of like, I feel like I just say, Hey, I work at like, I don't know, Walmart or Whole Foods or something. I wonder how do you, at the beginning, got into the business. I, I know you talk about David Swenson and like, obviously he's kind of like a one of the North star for like a lot of people. And I wonder like, you know, how do you get into this like job? Because there's, I'm, I bet like there's like many people who are like, you know, trying to get in. Yeah, I'm very- the LP world is actually like pretty small. Um, it's it's only like a few hundred people and it's like so random how people people get in um and uh it's completely random and I, for me i was in business school and i spent my business school summer at morgan stanley and was just like completely miserable i wanted to be a principal not an agent right and so i had a friend a guy who graduated a year behind me in college um who worked in the yale investments office his name was seth alexander he's now the chief investment officer at mit um, and I said to Seth, I go, Hey, what's it, what's it like? You know, I was, I was like trying to figure out what my next you know, path was going to be. Um, and, uh, and Seth said, you know, endowment management's amazing. It's the closest you'll ever come to managing your own multi-billion dollar fortune. Um, endowment investors are like the ideal investor because we have low liquidity needs, long time horizon, you know, few tax headaches, a single client. So there's a unification of purpose. Um, all this, all this stuff that makes endowments so great. And I said, wow, sounds amazing. And I'd taken David Swenson's class as an undergrad and then again in, in business school. And I knew Dean Takahashi in the Yale office. And I said, hey, you know, do you think I could interview? He said, well, we don't hire, you know, MBAs. You know, we like to hire. You missed your chance as an undergrad. Um, and so I was like, Damn, because talk to the Princeton guys. And when you go there, talk about timber because it's this great asset. Mm-hmm. If the price for the commodity is bad, you leave it in the ground and it continues to grow and has step function, you know, more value, all this you know, kind of wild stuff. Um, it's this great endowment asset. So I went to Princeton and had this, you know, he, he made the introduction. I applied, uh, changed my life. Um, I showed up, I talked about timber and they wanted to hire me to be on the real assets team. Um, and then I showed mm-hmm. up and... Um, and like two weeks after I showed up, the venture guy quit and nobody wanted to do venture because it was 2001 and venture was like in the doldrums. So here it was like summer of 2001. They're like, okay, who wants to be the venture guy? And everybody like touched their nose. And I was the last one. Like that's a simplified version of the events, but like basically that's how I fell in, you know, fell into venture and, and fell in love with it. I think you kind of like, you know, basically you're, you talk to the right people, right? People gave you the right information, talk about a secret code uh, and then getting in. And then there is, um, 
you know, you mentioned it as like you're um, falling into luck because no one wants to touch venture. I heard this about the internet before. So like people were trying to do something else, but like, and then some other people were like, oh, we don't want to do the internet thing. And then they happen to be the most successful, I don't know, in their career. What is the, t- what is today's equivalent of this? Is like, you know, everyone's paying attention to AI. Last year was crypto. Yeah. And the year before was VR, AR. And then the year before was AI again. And then the year before was crypto. So basically there's like, I see the three theme, like every year is the same thing. Uh, every like three years, kind of like the same thing over yeah. again. I wonder what does that entail for like the younger people who are trying to make their career and what is like the right or, or what is like the road that like the lucky bus is going to hit you on? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, there's like survivorship bias, um, you know, in in every one of these discussions because, you know, here I am talking to you about all this stuff because I happen to, you know, have a crappy summer at Morgan Stanley. If I'd had a good summer, I'd be like some grindy banker, you know, living in Greenwich and, you know, f- or who knows, right? Like, um, so, you know, the lucky bus hits some people and, and not others. Um, you know, what I'd tell people is uh, the, um, the thing that's most uh, important is to be like ready for the opportunity, right? Like the, the readiness is, you know, Hamlet says this, the readiness is all. Um, Mm -hmm. And, uh, and getting out there and and kind of constantly learning and constantly trying to figure out how to give more than you get, right? Like, again, this is like a vibes thing. And I really started believing this when I moved to California, like the energy you give out is the energy you get back. Mm -hmm. And if you're giving out great energy all the time and you're like, you know, kind of pushing, um, you know, doing interesting stuff. And, and by the way, like one thing that it's, it's almost a cliche, but it's, I've seen, I've seen it, um, in practice, like, you know, you gotta, we like, it's just like my boy Drake says, we started from the bottom. Now we're here. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, everybody starts somewhere and you gotta like grind it out and people really appreciate smart people who have humility and are willing to grind. And if you can like, you know, maybe do stuff that you think is quote unquote beneath you, people will take notice of that. And they'll be, you know, some people won't, they'll be like, oh, I've got a grinder. But like, that's one of the problems that we have, you know, kind of right now we have too many queens and not enough drones, right? Like in the hive Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and building that experience, um, uh, you know, uh, organically is really important and getting out there. Like, I think people are too comfortable with like work from home and, and living in two dimensions. Um, I think, you know, getting out there and, and meeting people is really important. Amazing. Hi, Laura. I just wanted to say hi to the audience. What is like something that you, you went on like a lot of podcasts. What are something that you haven't been asked about and then you feel like the world should know? <laughs> You know, that's a great question. Um, I feel like we've covered a lot of things in a lot of different contexts. I feel like we covered a lot of things today. Um, But uh, I'd have to think about that one a little bit. Um, You know, I got to say, like, one thing that that, um, And it's kind of timely because today is the big like um, social media hearing um, on Capitol Hill. And this is something that, that I talk about with other LPs a bunch. I talk about with GPs a lot. Um, but, you know, there's there's a lot going on in the world, you know, where people want what we've got and whether it's kind of state actors, um, uh, uh, you know, like um, like Russia or, um, or Iran, um, you know, and TikTok's been, a lot of people have been pointing the finger at TikTok. I have no, you know, kind of knowledge or opinion either way, but it is amazing how, um, how easy it is to manipulate public opinion today. And, you know, even non-state actors, right? There's, um, there's a lot that's going on in the world that is, you know, kind of threatening to upend, um, you know, kind of what's, the the kind of magical um you know uh experiment that we've got going on um and part of that you know is also like um you know we're, we're devoting a lot of mental energy to having like all these weird you know kind of you know and culture is important i'm not saying but like there's all these like weird culture words like people are talking people are talking to me about whether taylor swift is like a department of defense asset like trying to disrupt our election like no what we should actually be talking about like how we can be 
you know, um, how we can be like reshoring, you know, kind of chip manufacturing, um, you know, like there's, th that's the kind of stuff that's actually like, I think going to set the quality of our life, you know, kind of 50, 60 years down the road. Wow. Sorry to get heavy. I, uh, on that note, I want to end with something lighter. Um, what are you having for lunch today? <laughs> um, it's really crappy weather here in Palo Alto. So I've got a Joe in the juice right across the street. So I'm going to like scurry across the street to, to grab, um, grab, uh, my favorite, which is the Joe's club, um, with, uh, with extra tomatoes and mozzarella. Wow. It's just me between you and lunch. So I don't want to waste too much of your time. No, and... this is awesome. Um, you are so fun to talk to. Um, the vibe was immaculate. And, you know, thanks, Laura and Mason for saying hello. And, uh, and if anybody ever wants to reach out, I'm, I'm easy to find. So just hit me with a LinkedIn. And, um, and I'm always glad to chat and bounce ideas around. Follow Chris on Twitter or any other platform. Google him. Read his blog since like 2017. And please, uh, anyway, thank you so much, Chris, for coming on the show today. Thank you, Grace. This is amazing. Okay, let me end.